So a couple years ago, I went to Mars. I took with me a graduate student from the physics department at Carnegie Mellon University. And we went out to the Mars Desert Research Station in the upper desert in Utah. Um, small, 30 feet across, um, metal habitat where six of us lived in very cramped conditions in isolation. You can see my bedroom. <laughs> and we had severe water rationing. We went outside in spacesuits through an airlock. We ended up having rehydrated, dehydrated food for weeks and studying the human factors of space colonization, like food fatigue. Our limited communication was based on what astronauts would actually have if they went to Mars. And you can see on some of these, there's very little vegetation. There's red rocks scattered all around. But one of the best parts was that very first night was exceptionally clear. It was so clear that we stood out. It takes about a half an hour for humans to adapt their night vision to see very dark things. We stood out and we watched the sunset, the twilight happen, and we stood there while the stars came out, and there were thousands of stars. With the Milky Way arching overhead, it was a spectacular night. So there's something that happens when you are out under a dark night sky like that. Sometimes you look up and you realize that we're on the surface of a sphere. And you're not really looking up, you're looking out. And you get this sense of vertigo and disorientation so that if you're laying in the grass, you clutch the grass because you feel like you're lifting up off the grass into the stars. It's called celestial vaulting. You know how many of you have seen this? But when I got back to Pittsburgh, I realized three things. That Pittsburgh, <laughs> well, three things. First, I realized that I really love fresh orange juice. <laughs> and I, I could not go to Mars because the gravity of family would bring me back to Earth. But also, the Pittsburgh was a wash of light everywhere. There was just light. You could see the stadiums and you could see the... Um, to the casinos and downtown area and all the rivers and all the population centers. And that light scatters up and out so that it goes into the suburbs and it goes into the rural countryside. And this, as a writer, I call the inciting incident or my call to action because I'm passionate about stopping the creep of light pollution. Here's a map of Pennsylvania, and you can see the light pollution is pretty much ever pervasive. You notice a little dark spot. That's four hours off Route 28. That's Cherry Springs State Park, the darkest place in the state, in case you want to go see the Milky Way, those of you who have never seen it. You can see from this that there are hardly any spots east of the Mississippi that are free from light pollution. Hardly anywhere can you actually see good, clear, dark skies now. 80% of the people in the United States live in the cities, and about 50% of the people in the world live in cities. You can see coastlines are bright, cities are bright, and 18 kilometers of roadways are bright. This light pollution keeps us from the stars, it obliterates the stars, and we lose that connection to the skies and each other, because one sky connects us all. So we're isolated into local pockets instead. I haven't actually described what light pollution is yet, and some of you are probably thinking air pollution. Light pollution is the excessive, obtrusive, misdirected artificial light at night. And you could see the world map. So what do astronomers do? There's only dark spots in the middle of the ocean. You cannot put an observatory on a boat. We need rock steady for observatories. And so we go up into the mountains, into very far distant mountains, as far as you can go from any civilizations. You want high and you want dry also. So the Atacama Desert in Chile 
is one of the places where they're putting lots of telescopes now. Um, the telescope that's there right now that just started is the large Atacama millimeter, submillimeter array. They're also putting the giant Magellan telescope there and the extremely large European telescope. Uh, and the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope is going in. And yet, even Chile doesn't understand. It's a country that should know that their sky is their national treasure. But there's 24-hour mining going in nearby. There's a roadway with brightly lit way stations going in. Even they don't seem to realize that this is a treasure. All over the world, you can see this sky glow. This is Los Angeles in 1908. Sky glow is the glow above the city. Sometimes it's a yellowish or hazy orange color. Um, light pollution is increasing at a rate of 6% per year so far. Uh, did you hear the story about LA in 1994? Some of you were around then, where there was a blackout after an earthquake, and all the people started calling the police and the local radio stations. What is that ominous cloud hanging over our heads? Because <laughs> they didn't recognize their own Milky Way galaxy. They'd never seen it before. And most children nowadays live in cities and will never see the Milky Way, especially the, the less able to go to parks and yachts and things, those children. I feel bad. Observatories are ending up getting abandoned all over the place. This is um, in Ann Arbor. You can see it from space. You can see how much light there is now. And an observatory overgrown with weeds. A night sky from the country, a night sky from the city. There's a huge difference. We see like a dozen stars in Pittsburgh. You can see constellations. When you see a sky with thousands of stars, you are no longer seeing constellations. Um, that There's so many stars that, that you can't even pick out your favorite constellations anymore. You can do this in a planetarium. You can turn, crank the knob up all the way and see thousands of stars, and you'll see the, the point. So, most people seem to think that this is just a problem for astronomers. Light pollution is for astronomers. But that's not actually true because the nighttime patterns and the ecosystems at night have the same, it's the same set of patterns that during the day. So the animals at night, you have 30% of vertebrates are nocturnal and twice that many invertebrates are nocturnal and they have their own patterns and we've disrupted this ecosystem with our 100 year, basically, change of the life of the world. And that's not enough time for them to adapt. We've changed things so that predators can find prey differently. Scientists are studying nesting habits and um, migration. We, we see the effect over and over and over, and you've heard it. You've heard the story of, say, sea turtle hatchlings on the beaches, especially in Florida, where 90% of them come up to hatch. They are looking for the shimmering light on the moonlight on the water, and instead they go up to the shimmering boardwalk lights, and thousands of them every year, these little hatchlings are killed until we now have an endangered species. They're killed because cars run over them, they die of dehydration or starvation, or predators get them. So in the years since we first started studying sea turtle hatchlings, we've found out that if you use red lights, they're not as attracted. If you use room darkening shades inside, or if you take your lights and you just lower them so you can't see them from the beach, maybe they're their people height instead of on huge boom arms. And we've made some inroads, and there is hope and a slight upturn change for the good. Um, birds are another thing. A lot of people, since the 19, or since the 1880s, we've had lighthouses. We knew birds fly into lighthouses and are attracted by light and crash and die. But did you realize the number that are directly killed by light pollution every year? is between 9.8 million and 1 billion birds. So it's not just the birds and the sea turtles 
it's fish and reptiles, um, big pollinators at night, bats and moths are being affected. And it affects across, across the board. Plants are affected, trees are affected, and it affects humans too. So we know that there's melatonin suppression because of light at night. And studies are being take underway now to see just how harmful it is. We know that it's a serious problem, it's a serious environmental problem, and it's probably a serious health problem for a lot of us. I'm not a medical doctor, but I'm not gonna sleep with the night lights on anymore. <laughs> so. Um, green button. So this sky glow has such an effect, and the reason why I'm talking to you now, the reason why I'm so passionate about this, now is the time to change things. Because the people who remember the way the night sky should look, we're getting older and there's not gonna be many of us around anymore. And people nowadays think this is what it's supposed to look like. A million years of evolution went into making us afraid of the dark. And why is that? We have cell phones in our pockets that have apps that have flashlights on them. We don't have ferocious wild animals in the city anymore. Don't be afraid of the dark. Don't fear the dark. And there's also another thing, cultural change. I wanna see some cultural change. Why is light good and dark is bad? We gotta change that. So one of the ways that I'm working on changing things is New tech. We now have LEDs. The 2014 Physics Nobel Prize was given out for the man who invented the blue LED. Three men who won the, who simultaneously worked on blue LEDs. The one on the, the right is with a white light LED, which means you took the red LEDs and the green LEDs, which we already had, and put the blue LEDs with them, and now we have fairly inexpensive ways to change our city lights. And it will cost us less in the long run because they're so much more economical to run. So the one picture with the reddish lights, those are sodium vapor lights. That's what we used to have, and now we have the white lights. In Pittsburgh, we're changing out the city lights. We're doing 40,000 lights. We've already done about 3,000 of them. Uh, the Remaking Cities Institute at CMU, researchers there are putting together a tome of information of best practices and how to do this, how to change out the city lights. It'll be ready for fall for anyone who wants to download and read it. Uh, the Heinz Endowments gave us a grant and it is pumping us up to do a year of astronomy outreach, especially with an eye towards light pollution. This is what you can do. This is what you can all do. This is your, your tasks. Look at your lights around your house. Just go out and look at them. If you have the lollipop ones, not good. If you have ones shining light up and out, not good. Especially with the advent of the LEDs, the white light LEDs, Blue light scatters more than red light in our atmosphere. So we're getting more scatter. The more you change to these whiter lights, that's uh, Rayleigh scattering. Blue light with its shorter wavelength scatters more easily than red light. That's why the sky is blue, in case you wondered. <laughs> and so what we wanna do is full cutoff lights. The bulb has to be up inside the fixture, shielded at 45 degree angle. You can switch out your lights, or you can just put lower wattage bulbs, use a timer, use a dimmer, use a motion sensor, so it's activated only when there's motion nearby, or just turn them off when you're not using them. And worry about light trespass. Is your light going into your neighbor's windows? That's something that there should be more ordinances. There should be more laws about light pollution. So, this year of astronomy outreach, we've started already. We decided to enact social change by using art, a concept you just heard about a few, a few talks back. So we've been going into museums and going into art studios and painting beautiful objects. 
objects in the night sky like comets and galaxies and nebula and planetscapes, starry nights. And we've been trying to educate the public about light pollution and make beautiful things. We actually did this one with pop craft art in a bar. <laughs> It's down on this, in the Strip District. But if you draw beautiful things, then maybe people will want to go out and actually see them. So that's my thought. We also have one more thing going. This is our Pittsburgh constellation. We took an interactive Google map, and on it we put little points of light where all the things of astronomical interest were. Museums and observatories, planetaria, places you could go to see a lecture or take a class in astronomy. All of those are dots on this map. And a constellation is a pattern of stars in the night sky. So what is our Pittsburgh constellation? What is this pattern in the night sky on our map? Um, we're having a cash prizes contest for artists or anyone. And you tell me what this pattern in the night sky looks like to you. <laughs> whatever you want, <laughs> we send them in, win some money. <laughs> Do you know what that is? Pierogi. <laughs> <laughs> so we did some big gestures this beginning of this year. We turned the lights off in Pittsburgh. This was for Earth Hour, which happened on March 28th from 8.30 to 9.30 p.m., and we gathered on the roof of the Science Center, about 100 of us, businessmen, politicians, scientists, artists, all together. It was 17 degrees and windy. It was awful. <laughs> so if you missed it, I know where you were. You were inside like we should have been. <laughs> so we were watching the lights. And just at 8.30, one of them went out. And then another, the rooftop signage, the bridges, the fountain, the inclines, the Science Center, Station Square. We saw... Some of the lights go out, and I feel bad that there's the dark, there's the light. Can you see the difference? <laughs> We're going to do this again next year. Every year for Earth Hour, all around the world, buildings turn their lights out. The Kremlin went dark, the Eiffel Tower, the Parthenon, the Golden Gate Bridge, Times Square. Lots of places do this. So every year, everybody's going to do this. Turn your lights out for one hour. You can see... The Grand, the Wyndham Grand, the PPG Towers, the Gulf Tower, the k Gates Building. I mean, you could see some of the things here that went dark. The fountain, the most obvious. So, this is what this year is going to hold, is a lot of astronomy outreach, and hopefully this Earth Hour will build until it's like light-up night but the opposite. <laughs> and hopefully people won't call it loot up night. <laughs> no. So I entreat you to be guardians of the earth and to see that one sky connects us all. Carpe noctum, seize the night.